is in honor of our quarterly birthday, so please join us at Sure to Be Good Time. Are there any other announcements to be made? Let us go to the Lord in worship. Oh. 
We have laid down the burdens of our own limitations and fears at the foot of the cross. Now we are able to walk in faith as followers of Christ and to live out our calling to shine God's light in the world. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ alone is faithful. Through faith in the amazing grace of our Lord, we are saved. In Jesus' name, I declare unto you today that we have confessed our sins, and our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
As we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace, so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses, so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today is Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. You can find it on page 505 in the front portion of your pew Bible. Listen to God's word for you. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden from me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Well, the choir just preached, so I'll get that down. Except for I've already written it, so we may as well go ahead, right? Our second lesson this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. You can find that on page 16 in the New Testament, the back portion of your pew Bible. Listen to God's word for all of us. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to Peter, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, last week we were in Luke's gospel and we looked at Luke's story about when Jesus first called those first disciples. We heard the good news that our sinfulness, our sense of inadequacy are no match for the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. We can depend on Jesus, who is always enough for whatever we are facing, and who promises that he is going to transform our earthly lives so that they will have an eternal significance. Well, today, you may have noticed we're not in Luke's gospel anymore. We are over in Matthew's gospel, and it may have only been a week since our last lesson, but a lot has happened in Peter and Jesus and the disciples' lives since that day when Jesus first called them on the lake shore. In Matthew's gospel, after Jesus called the first disciples, he starts teaching and healing. We have, remember, the three full chapters of the Sermon on the Mount where we hear Jesus' new take on the Old Covenant that goes beyond just our outward obedience to the letter of the law straight to our heart, what motivates us, our heart's desire to follow God's word. Jesus healed many people. He sent the disciples out on their own for the first time, and they had authority to heal and to teach like Jesus. By the time we arrive at chapter 14, Jesus has just received that terrible news that John the Baptist has been beheaded by Herod. And he tries to get away from the crowd so that he can grieve. But the crowd was having none of that. You'll remember that they followed him out into that desert place, and it was there that the disciples tried to send the crowd away, but Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And they broke the loaves and the fish and fed the multitude. So that's the beginning of chapter 14, and now Jesus really needs a break. Um, he's probably pretty well done, I would imagine. And so he's, it says he actually compelled, he forced the disciples to go on ahead of him and he would dismiss the crowds. And then he went up on that mountain to pray. He wanted a moment of solitude. This story is one of the most memorable stories. People know this even if they've never read God's word. It's at the same time beyond comprehension and yet totally relatable. After all, have any of you ever walked on water or witnessed someone who has? I haven't. If you have, please do tell. But that's just a huge, beyond life spectacle, and that spectacle draws us into the story. And yet, I think. 
think despite that great story, we can all relate to the disciples' struggle with faith and fear that day. This past Monday, I met with our Sermon Starter Bible Study, which is moving to Tuesday this week. When is it moving to? Tuesday. That's right, Tuesday. So when we start our Bible study each week, I always begin by asking people to share something about themselves that I try to relate, sometimes better than others, to our lesson. And I ask them to share the story of a time when they were caught in a storm. With one caveat, no Hurricane Hugo stories. Okay? So no Hugo stories. And the accounts were quite dramatic. We had everything from a sandstorm in the desert to a snowstorm up north, north, all the way to a tornado right here in the south. It seemed that everyone could relate to that disciple's terrifying experience of being caught in a physical storm. And I imagine that on a spiritual level, we all also have endured times in our lives where that proverbial wind was against us. That time when Jesus seemed nowhere to be found. We all have longed for confirmation that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. We all have faltered in our faith. We started to sink when fear took hold. And friends, there is good news for us in our verses today. As Jesus did for Peter that day, he still meets us in each of these scenarios saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. So our story begins where Jesus is on the mountain praying in what I imagine must be blissful solitude after all the peopling he had done that day. But the disciples, they are struggling in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew tells us that the wind was against them. Now, for those of us who've ever gone boating, most of us have motors, right? So we don't fully appreciate what it means that the wind was against them. Without that motor to power through, they were getting nowhere fast. They had been rowing all night long, not making any progress. And so Jesus, however, if you look at the story, they didn't get there on their own. Did you notice? Jesus was the one who sent them out on the sea to struggle. And that was the first thing that struck me about this story. This difficult spot where the disciples found themselves was not one of their own making. And when I think about this reality that they were there on the sea struggling by divine design, my first, um, you know, reaction as the fairness monitor of my family is to stomp my foot and say, well, that's not fair. Why would Jesus do that? Why would he send them out to struggle? It reminds me of the times when I have felt like the proverbial wind was against me. Those times where I felt like nothing I did would make a difference. It just kept going and going. So if we look at our text today, we realize that struggling is not necessarily a sign that we are going in the wrong direction. Now, sometimes we make bad choices, right? Sometimes we make our bed and we have to lie in it. We have to reap the consequences for the bad choices we have made. But as Christians, we should not expect that following Jesus is going to grant us immunity from the storms of life. St. John of the Cross was a 16th century Spanish mystic, and he wrote a poem and described what he named the dark night of the soul. This is the time in a Christian's life when they have previously experienced the presence of God and they suddenly feel alone. Whatever the normal ways of connecting with God in the past don't seem to work anymore. And this is a difficult time in our spiritual journey, one where the proverbial wind is against us. Friends, however, the dark night of the soul never lasts forever. 
There is a saying that it is always darkest just before dawn, right? And that is exactly when Jesus comes out to meet the disciples. It is the fourth watch of the night just before dawn when they're exhausted and it is dark. And we notice that when Jesus shows up, the disciples don't even recognize him at first. They thought he might be a ghost. In her commentary on this passage, Mitzi Smith wonders, perhaps Jesus looked like a ghost because the Jesus that the disciples left on the other side of the sea looked overworked, fatigued, drab, and unsteady. Perhaps they were not accustomed to seeing Jesus look so rested, in control, and peaceful. Thus, they think he is a ghost. Perhaps. Whatever the reason, Peter is not one to mince words. He wanted confirmation that Jesus was who Jesus said he was, and so he boldly proclaims, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, much ink has been spilled about Peter's experience of walking on the waves for a few moments. And this week, as I looked at the text, what stood out to me most was the motivation behind Peter's steps of faith. Peter wanted confirmation that it was Jesus, even after Jesus had already told him who he was. Now, our NRSV translation of Jesus' words say, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. However, a more literal translation is, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. When Jesus says, I am, his Jewish disciples and Matthew's Jewish readers would have immediately connected Jesus' declaration to God's name that God shared with Moses at the burning bush. Where God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so as Jesus stood above the stormy waters and declared, I am, he revealed his divinity that stretched all the way back to creation. Remember when the Spirit of God hovered under the over the waters of chaos? Ever since the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew has been writing, he tells us to show us that Jesus is Emmanuel, which we learned at Advent means God with us. Here in chapter 14, we see it. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, on top of the chaos of our world. Peter wanted to know that Jesus was all that Jesus said he was. And I know that I have had that same desire on more than one occasion. There are times in our faith journeys when we have to set aside our fear and take a giant step of faith, trusting Jesus is who he says he is. There are times in our journey when we don't know which way to go, when we aren't sure, is this from God or is this just some ghost of my own imagination's making? And we need to know Jesus is who he says he is. As we look at Peter's example for us that day, we hear Jesus' invitation. Come. Come to me. See for yourself who I am. Jesus invited Peter to step out in faith, and for just a moment, Peter walked on water with Jesus. It was all going great, until Peter noticed that the storm didn't stop for his hallmark moment with Jesus. How dare the storm keep breaking? I mean, if you were writing the story, everything would have been still, right? But that's not how it worked. And as he started to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabbed his hand and pulled him up and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? In her commentary on this passage, Chelsea Harmon asks, What if we tried a new way of hearing Jesus' question to Peter? Instead of hearing Jesus say, You of little faith, why did you doubt? As a judgment question or accusation. What if Jesus was asking Peter a learning or a faith-building question?
Friends, the truth is we all falter in our faith. We all have doubts and fears. When Jesus asked Peter, why did you doubt? Peter didn't answer him. Perhaps Peter doubted because he thought getting out of the boat was about him and he had different expectations for what would happen on that water. Perhaps Peter doubted because he took his focus off of Jesus and looked at the chaos around him. What about us? Why do we doubt? And how can we choose faith over fear? Well, at this point in the story, no one's looking at Peter. That's good news. As they get back in the boat and the storm finally stops, everyone sees Jesus for who he is. And they respond in the only appropriate way. They worship him. <coughs> Last week, we learned with Peter that we don't have to be enough because Jesus is enough. We can depend on Jesus to overcome our sins and our limitations and transform our lives with eternal significance. And today, the focus shifts from that internal struggle that we face when we don't think we're enough to the external struggle we face when the world is too much. We're usually struggling with one or the other, aren't we? And we learn that we can depend on Jesus when the world is a chaotic and stormy sea. When we look at this familiar story and we consider what it means for us to have faith that is greater than our fear, we are reminded again like Peter, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Faith is about Jesus who is Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us in the middle of life's stormy seas when we are rowing just as hard as we can, but it doesn't seem like we're making any progress. He is with us when we don't recognize him standing right in front of us. He's with us when we desperately want confirmation that Jesus is who Jesus says he is, that our faith is real. He is with us when we look at the conditions of our world and our faith starts to crumble in doubt. He is there to pull us up and save us. And friends, he is with us here in the boat gathered with God's people, seeing Jesus for who he is and responding in the only appropriate way as we fall at his feet and worship, saying, surely this is the Son of God. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And so wherever this second week of Lent will take us, I invite you to hear these words from Jesus for us his current disciples, rowing our boats in whatever direction God has sent us. Take heart. I am. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
aside his nets and follow you, for his bold faith and for the example he gives us. As we set out this week, we pray that you will help us to embody the faith that has been passed down through all generations. Father, help us to look to you as the firm foundation. When the seas rise and the wind blows, may we see you as our steady rock to which we can always cling. We pray today especially for those who are in a stormy season, those whose lives are clouded with grief and sorrow and fear. We pray for those whose lands are torn by war and division. We ask that you will help us to be peacemakers, those who bring good news of your love and of your kingdom. May this church shine your light and embody the goodness of Jesus Christ so that others will come to know that they are loved. Father, as we go out this week and continue our Lenten journey, help us to be ever mindful that you are with us. As together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we respond to God in worship, we respond by offering, we offer some of what we have, but all of who we are. I invite you during this time of offertory to consider the ways that God is calling you to respond in faith.
If you don't like it, sorry. <laughs> As you go this week, know that Jesus is enough. You can depend on him. Know that Jesus is faithful and Jesus says, take heart. I am Do not be afraid. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his face.